Please pray with me. Holy One, speak to our hearts your message of love and new life. Amen. What about gratitude? Over the past 17 months, many people had genuine difficulty being grateful for very much. But if we pause, we will be surprised as to what we could have been grateful for. Example, in the first and second waves of the pandemic, most people lived in fear. We wondered if we would have enough food. Shockingly, toilet paper suddenly became a hot commodity. We lined up at grocery stores to get what we needed. We were suspicious of others. We hunkered down, not because we wanted to, but because we needed to. Businesses suffered, wage earners suffered, and our schools and higher academic institutions were shuttered. Students and staff suffered. Life looked grim and terrifying. The gratitude now is that we have been through three stages. Even with this disturbing fourth wave, we are more prepared. There's enough food and other necessities of life. There are vaccines that we trust all will take. Healthcare and other essential workers are more knowledgeable about the viruses. More lives, thankfully, are being saved. We had new technology to connect us as we are doing now. We could still be in touch and still be in community. We had people deliver food. No, it was not hotel room service, but food was delivered, and that was a saving grace. At some stage, we were shut off from our loved ones, but now we can physically reconnect with them. We were locked down, but not to minimize various mental health concerns. We are now more aware and not as fearful. We trust today that our past will help us navigate our present and future. We do have lots to be thankful for. In our Psalm today, I am inspired about the way the Psalmist gives thanks with all of his heart. It made me relive a moment of being ungrateful in my childhood years. One time when someone gave me a gift which I considered useless, I responded with a half-hearted, feeble thanks out of obligation. I certainly won't do that again. In contrast, the psalmist doesn't mumble. He gave thanks with all that he had. It's like his heart was bursting forth. First, he's with friends. And then he can't wait. He's got to tell more. And then he's with a larger group. I have to confess that some days that's not where I'm at. I'm back at the mumbling stage. Of course, I'm thankful for many things and gifts that God has blessed me with. Food, shelter, health, family, friends, a partner, acquaintances, and colleagues who like, love, and care about me, to name only a few. I am grateful. Yet I find that as the news feeds ping on my phone, or I read articles about another occurrence of social injustice, indigenous issues, growing environmental concerns, persistent poverty, ever-present blatant festering racial injustices, homelessness, historical and present child abuse, and the list goes on. I am dismayed. I realize, however, that even as I am saddened by such, there is reason and there is reason to be. I also have good reason to give thanks. Today, I'm inspired by the psalmist to continue to give thanks to God, reflect on what God is doing in the world, my role in that participation, to share thanks and generally be more grateful. Psalm 111 is a hymn or a poem of thanksgiving. It's also about theology as it tells us all about God. The unknown psalmist tells people of the need to collectively praise God. After his pronouncement, he decided to cheerlead the praise in verse one. I will give thanks to God with my whole heart. How many of you have done something with your whole heart? That's when you give it all you've got. In fact, some folks even say, I really put my heart and soul into it. Here are my examples, the Olympics or any sports. When Andre de Grassi got the gold, when the women's soccer team got the goal, my vocal emotions took control. They all put their heart into it. 
when we do something the best we can, we put our whole heart into it and we are fulfilled, happy and want to share. Others respond likewise with praise. Ah, what about our heart? Much is written and discussed. Unfortunately, there has been some misunderstanding of biblical interpretations of the heart. We are told and understand the heart as the seat of emotion and the head as the domain of elect, intellect and rationality. This was not true in biblical times. During those times, the heart was seen not just as a host for emotion, but for morality, spirituality, determination and intellect. For example, let's glimpse at today's first reading in Kings 3. In verse 6, Solomon designates David's heart as righteous, as a means to describe Solomon's perception of David's morality. As was read, Solomon asked God for a heart to judge God's people fear. Consequently, when we see the psalmist's declaration to give God thanks with his whole heart, we see witness not only to the emotional proclamation, but also a statement of intellect and intention. The psalmist was so exuberant that he engaged others and declared God's goodness, God's deeds and redemption as we do today in a faith community. Verses two to four describe God's works or wonderful deeds. When the Hebrew word is translated, it means something that cannot be understood or simply remarkable. In essence, it is something that transcends human intelligence and imagination. It's difficult for us to fathom. Verses five to nine outline God's wonderful acts. And verse nine reminds us that God sent redemption to the people and that God is holy and awesome. Therein is the ABC of our theology. God initiates relationship with us through gracious action. We are called to respond in gratitude. We praise God both in formal liturgy and also in our way of living. Through all of this, God drew near in the story of the Israelites. The Psalm is about the Jewish exodus and their covenant with God. We as Christians transition from the deliverance in the wilderness and we focus on the person of Jesus the Christ. Just as God drew near to the Jews, God draws near to us through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Sections of the gospel connect to Psalm 111. In the gospel of John, also known as the Maverick gospel, Jesus is recorded as saying some astounding things. In this segment, the author has been taking us through what we call the bread of life discourse. In chapter six, Jesus metaphorically mentioned that he is the bread of life. Three times before we get to our text today, he has shocked and annoyed the religious leaders of the day even before he referenced and aligned himself to Moses and the manna from heaven. The author of John's gospel wanted to tell his community and us that the message is somehow the same, but the bread Jesus offered was more consequential than the manna in the wilderness. People will never die. Regardless of what one believes, this life that Jesus offered is not limited to a post-death heavenly experience. John had something different in mind with the phrase, the phrase eternal life. This is life offered beginning in the here and now. Some may call it abundant life. This intersection of past and present in the psalmist's experience and in the context of praise and worship provide a point of contact between the psalm and the Christian worshiping community. If the psalmist could recall the character of God and the recollection of God's work, we as Christians have more cause to state those words of praise. We praise God for God's works, not because of what God has done in the past, but because the work of God, the love of God, draws us repeatedly in the present, in the cup and the bread. Because of God's gift of unconditional love through Jesus, we are in covenant with God. We recall our baptism covenant, and we continue our commitment through the Eucharist, which we look forward to soon having in community. And we, like the psalmist, will rejoice with our whole heart full of gratitude. May it be so, may it be so.